Hello and welcome. I'm Samantha Mackay, lead trainer at Trudy. And as the Enneagram makes its way into the workplace, it seemed like a good time to chat with Steph Barron Hall, founder of The Nine Types, who uses the Enneagram to help teams improve their productivity and communication. Welcome, Steph. Thanks so much for having me. Happy to be here. And I'm really excited to talk about how we use the Enneagram with groups and in that group dynamic because often we use it in terms of either ourselves or in terms of relationships. Yeah, I think it's really one of the most powerful things that we can do with the Enneagram. I have found not only for me and my, you know, one-on-one relationships, but simply knowing, you know, even if you don't know somebody's type, knowing that they have a different motivation, that kind of unlocks a whole different perspective. And I think it's really, really helpful when it comes to communication in particular. Hmm. So what led you to using the Enneagram in the workplace and with teams? Yeah, I mean, it's always kind of been a thought for me. Um, When I was in undergrad, I actually was super fascinated with this concept of using personality systems with teams in particular. Um, And then I my um, master's degree is in organizational communication and leadership. And so that's kind of the framework that I use. I use a lot of communication theory. I use a lot of um, psychological theories even in thinking about leadership. And I bring those into the way that I approach the Enneagram with the teams that I work with. So what I really love about it is having the ability to, to go into a team and you know, this is something that I think a lot of coaches experience, but having the little aha moment. So when you say, oh, you know, this type often does this, or they often say this, or they often experience communication this way. And people are like, oh my gosh, we just had a conversation about that yesterday. I love having those moments and helping teams to understand each other and and themselves a lot better. So I'm curious. So how do you use the Enneagram with teams like in a, in a practical way? And then what are some of the common challenges that that come out of that? Yeah. So first and foremost, um, I normally like to help them figure out their type. So that might mean that I do typing interviews with everyone on the team first, especially with smaller teams. We normally, you know, set it up that way. Um, Or I, you know, send an assessment and have them walk through that and then also have them walk through my self-typing guide to kind of validate the the assessment a bit. Um, And then I go into a presentation. So I present the Enneagram to them and help them to understand, you know, the core motivation of each type, what the type is avoiding, um, some of the the common work style things and in ways that they can move forward in really simple ways. You know, you and I have a lot of experience in, you know, studying the Enneagram and, and we have all this theoretical knowledge, which is fantastic, but I really focus on simplifying things and and thinking what's the bare minimum that they need to know to kind of dip their toe into it and to start understanding it and start applying it in their daily lives. So from there, I typically take them into thinking about communication. You know, what are the different ways that we all communicate and how can we um, approach that in our lives? So I normally will facilitate conversations, um, ask them for their feedback as I'm going through the types and, and invite some of those conversations, depending on the size of the group, of course. Um, and then I also send them these um, communication packets. It's basically a booklet that I wrote um, to help them understand, you know, OK, I'm going into a meeting with this person. Um, how is this person, you know, what's their communication style? What do I need to look out for? What do I need to um, say, you know, when I'm approaching them? And then also for each individual, I have like a little snippet saying, this is how you can develop your communication style. Um, And so, of course, I'm always inviting people to validate things and say, you know, this might not be true of you because especially with communication, we have all these different layers, um, Mm. culture and background and all these different, you know, social identifiers that um, combine to make our communication style. And also with that knowledge, I have seen just over time how these certain threads kind of pull together through you know, different contexts, different um, workplaces, different people groups and everything. And and some of those communication threads still exist. So I really am, am trying to help them to identify the way that they approach communication and to meet others where they're at. I can, I can see how the, the value in keeping things a bit simple because most people don't want as much theory and knowledge as we have about it. It's about just how can I use this to improve my day-to-day work and effectiveness? Yeah. Yes, so exactly. Can you, I really want to get some examples. Like I really want to get a yeah. sense, like what's a team you've worked with and how are some ways that learning their Enneagram type really helped them? Yeah, I think 
you know, like I said, there's a lot of that like aha moment. So especially with teams that are really close. So looking at, you know, they have that sense of they're in the norming phase or the performing phase already. Um, yeah. So uh, the performing phase already. So they're, they're really in that phase of where they're doing really well together. Those teams in particular have really a sense of connection already. And so they can start to call things out and identify them. And so it helps because, you know, especially in a stressful work environment, I'm thinking of one example in particular, um, where I had two types paired together, an eight and a six. And, you know, the six was always excavating issues and excavating different problems and different challenges. And we had the eight just wanting to say, like, just cut it, move forward. And so really helping them to see like, oh, like the eight maybe could bend a little bit and say like, okay, I'm, I'm hearing that. And then the six could, um, you know, say, okay, I, I'm trusting that we're ready here. Um, so each kind of bending a little bit in that sense. And actually I've seen that dynamic play out in a lot of different teams. And then I also worked with a team one time where most of the, the, the people on the team were eights. Um, there is a management team. Oh. And um, so it was fascinating because they all, you know, they got everything done, um, but maybe it would have been better if they had more connection. You know, they had more connection mm. with the people who are reporting to them um, or with different people in the organization, like that could have made things easier. Um, of course, they had the strength of being able to go into a meeting that felt like a tennis match where everyone was just lobbying concepts back and forth and, and just processing, and they could cut through that and really get to you know, the meat of the thing um, at the end of the meeting. And so that's like kind of their superpower, but um, it was really helpful to be able to bring some more of those conversations to light. So you mentioned organizational development, and that I think is a really key part of how, you know, why teams matter and, and what we need to, you know, shape at work. So tell me a little bit more about that and how the Enneagram plays into that. Sure. So organizational development is really, or organization development, as it's called within the field, um, is really basically a, a, an umbrella term for a lot of the processes that we can use um, to help organizations develop into what they want to be or into what they need to be. So it can take a lot of different forms. And I think it's a very um, vague term. Um, but what I really appreciate about it is that even in all of you know my grad school, I, I went to grad school for this. And even in these classes, what I found with organization development is so often it was actually about personal development. So so often in those classes, you know, the papers that I was writing, um, all these different things is, is really about, you know, self-leadership. What does that look like um, with the concept that you can't lead others well unless you can lead yourself well? So that's why I sure. love this overlay with the Enneagram, because I find that the Enneagram is so powerful in cultivating self-awareness. Um, and actually, I, I've written a bunch about um, you know, this this process of how when we are communicating with others, we always have intrapersonal communication happening. So within yourself. So we have intrapersonal communicating communication happening um, concurrently with intrapersonal communication. So if we can understand our own intrapersonal, you know, hemisphere, basically, or atmosphere, then we can, you know, then go into those meetings where we can improve our interpersonal communication, because we've already kind of worked on our own self knowledge piece. Um, so it's really, really helpful, especially when we're thinking about, you know, approaching really challenging conversations, approaching workplace conflict, approaching, um, you know, stressful situations, especially understanding what your triggers are, you know, what's really going to make you upset, what's really going to make you feel stressed, what's really going to make you, you know, struggle in all these different ways. Those things are so crucial because that's going to help you in, you know, every conversation, every interaction you have within the workplace. And the benefit of the Enneagram as compared to some of the other systems is that it's not, you know, situational. It's not behavior based, meaning that if I'm working with a team, they're already thinking about how can I apply this in my marriage? How can I apply this with my roommate? How can I apply this in my friendships? So they're already bringing it back to their, their community. Um, and so I really like that sense of the whole person approach. And so the ethos that I was trained in with um, organization development is that whole person, like the really holistic uh, perspective on humans who are going to work every day and, and kind of being there. So um 
that's, that's really the approach that I take. And I really love working with very like heart forward or, um, you know, leaders that really put a high importance on personal development, because I find that they are the ones who understand that professional development comes from personal development most of the time. Um, and so I really love working with those leaders. And I think you've reminded me that organizations like at work is a place that can both bring out the best and the worst in us. Yes. And, <laughs> and self-leadership almost feels like a reasonably new concept in the scheme of organizational development. You know, it's mm -hmm. not, you know, we spent many decades focusing on just growing the senior leaders rather than actually thinking about, you know, leadership being a skill we have to develop from the day we walk into an organization, the day we start work is when we start building our self-leadership yeah. skills. And it, yeah, the Enneagram is a really great tool that we can apply. Like we can, can no matter where we are in life, it's a self-leadership tool. I think that's a really yeah. important point. Yeah. And I think a big part of self-leadership is self-accountability, um, which I used to be really allergic to this concept of self-accountability and like discipline. I was like, no, self-compassion, you know? Um, and I think that's because my personal bent is to be, to really like, um, drive forward really intensely. And so I was really working on pulling back, but I really like this concept of self-accountability because, um, if you can be accountable to yourself and say, Hey, you know, I'm, I'm worth it or, or, Hey, like I committed to this or whatever it needs to be. Um, then you can, you know, lead yourself well and show up. And I think this is so crucial in our current environment because we see all these conversations happening, like different organizations saying, okay, everyone is remote forever, or we're hybrid, or if you don't come back in the office, you're fired. Um, we have all these different conversations happening. And I think what the, the organizations that, you know, are saying, if you don't come back, you're fired. Um, I think a lot of the time, what they are neglecting is that concept of self-leadership and how if we invest in employees on that level, then we can say, you know what, actually, they are going to be accountable because they're going to show up for their work every day. They show up for themselves every day. They're leading themselves really well. So I can trust that when they're at home, they are doing good work and maybe even for a lot of people doing their best work. Um, of course, there are other challenges like with communication. I've worked with a bunch of teams who who used to be in the office and have now not seen each other in years. Um, so that happens as well. But um, I just think that's so crucial to, to start to build that sense of self-leadership um, in your employees the second they walk in the door and not in a coercive way where you're like, this is what it looks like to lead yourself, but in a way that invites them to develop that for themselves. Mm, there's been such a, like almost a push approach to things in organizations for quite a long time. It's almost hard to think about inviting people um, because, I mean, and this is a slightly different model, but Sometimes it feels like our, our leaders and managers feel the need to take parental roles and see everyone mm -hmm. else's children, which plays out certain patterns that doesn't make space for inviting or almost heart-based leadership, as you've mentioned. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, you know, especially in the OD framework, but I think this is, this is pretty general as well. Um, that's the difference between a leader and a manager. A manager is more, you know, micromanaging or, or managing the people or, or making sure that they're all doing these things. Um, a leader is somebody who doesn't necessarily have to have that role, but they are able to embody those characteristics that they want in themselves and they want to develop in other people and to, to really invite people and bring them along. So I think that's why it's so powerful and so important. So clearly I could talk to you about organizational development all day. So let's, uh, before I get stuck on that train, tell me if someone wants to use the Enneagram at work, what should they be mindful of? You've mentioned a few already, but what else do we need to consider? Mm -hmm. I think it's really important to think about, you know, who is going to be presenting it um, and who is going to be, you know, sharing the perspective, um, making sure that that person is well qualified, making sure that they have, you know, some experience doing it. Um, I know that in a lot of organizations, people get started by just saying, hey, I'd love to teach on this. So if you're the person who's going to be doing that, um, make sure that you're setting some ground rules, make sure that you're setting some, um, 
you know, expectations and make sure that you're not going around and, and overdoing it with the Enneagram and um, making people really turned off to it. Um, and I also think one thing that's been really helpful for me is just knowing that I mean, I, I don't know if I've ever been asked a new question at this point, you know, in 2022, I don't think I've been asked a question I've never heard before about the Enneagram. Um, but, you know, being prepared to answer those questions and and for people who have a lot of skepticism and making space mm. for that, like there have been times when people have said, you know, is this all made up? Do, do you ever just feel like it's, you know, it doesn't matter and it's all made up. And yes, you know, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes I'm like, <laughs> what is this thing? You know, why am I even doing this? Right. So yeah. I think that being able to be honest about that and kind of holding it that way and not, you know, beating people over the head with it, but allowing them, you know, to have space and inviting them and saying, okay, maybe this isn't the tool that you end up using. Um, but what can you take from this and learn about yourself and get curious about yourself? And, and that's the entire framework that I really use is saying, this is something that's kind of a symbol that's meant to symbolize, you know, something that you can get curious about within yourself. Um, so how can you get curious about that? How can you do some inner work, some processing, some exploration to see what else is underneath the surface, um, especially mm. for those of us who have a harder time slowing down and actually doing that type of work? Yeah, that, that can be tricky. That can definitely be tricky. Um, yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing all of your insights about working with the Enneagram and Teams. Um, how can people find you? Yeah, uh, you can find me online. Uh, my website is ninetypes.co. No www, just ninetypes.co. Um, and then on Instagram at ninetypesco. So it's all spelled out. Some people like to call it 90 pesco. It's just a fun little inside joke with uh, my, my followers. But um, yeah, you can find me either of those places and I would be happy to chat with you more about this or you know, if you want a typing interview or, or any of those sorts of things, I, I'd love to talk to you. Awesome. Thank you so much, Steph. I've really, it's been great talking with you today. Thank you so much.